Eventually, we will learn to write data structures to handle our data, but first we need to cover the basics of the simple array. In C++, arrays are the simplest data type for storing a series of values. Some characteristics of a simple array is that all elements stored in the list must be of the same data type. There are no functions for our arrays. For example, we must keep track of the array's size manually. And arrays cannot be resized. You set a specific size during its declaration, and that size cannot change during the program. Arrays can store any data type that you could use for a variable, like int, boolean, floats, strings, or even user-made objects. Each element in an array has its own index, which is its position in the array. The first index is 0. In an array of size 4, the first element is at index 0, and the last one is at index 3. Like a normal non-array variable, an array declaration requires the data type and the name of the variable, but we must also specify the array's size when we're creating it. We can declare an array without the size specified only if we are initializing the array with a list of data. We still need the square brackets to specify that it's an array. For loops become really handy once we start using arrays. We can use a loop to iterate through all of the elements of an array pretty easily. When we get into memory management, we will learn how to make dynamic arrays. Arrays that can be assigned a size at runtime, instead of hard-coded into the program code. The reason C++ arrays do not have the ability to resize deals with memory allocation. When an array is declared, as with any variable, memory is set aside for this item. The amount of memory taken up is dependent on the data type. For example, ints and floats take 4 bytes, and a boolean takes 1 byte. An array allocates enough memory for that amount of data type. So if we have an array of 5 integers, then it needs 20 bytes. Another reason that these simple arrays cannot be resized is that the elements are stored sequentially in memory, one after another. So let's say we have an array of size 5, and it takes up 5 memory blocks. But when we create another variable, which takes up the memory block after our array, that means we can't resize our array anymore elements in the simple array must be sequential, and we cannot add to the array because if there's something else at the end, well, then it's not sequential anymore. Well, why can't we store different elements of an array in different parts of memory? Why can't we just keep track of it? The simple arrays aren't smart enough to handle that sort of thing. It really just keeps track of the size of its data type, and how many items it has, and so it knows how to walk between the elements. It doesn't keep any sort of information on what the different memory addresses are. So C++ is too stupid too, but you could do it. And later on in the class we will do that. We'll write our own special custom objects where we can make an array of any size, and we'll keep track of the memory addresses of the elements of the array. We'll cover that once we go over pointers and classes later on. When we're passing array as arguments into a function, they behave a little bit differently than our normal non-array variables. So because arrays can normally take up a lot of memory, C++ automatically passes arrays by reference. While most variables are passed by value by default and we have to manually and explicitly tell it to pass by reference, arrays are not. They're always passed by reference. If they were passed by value, like non-array variables, your program would be really inefficient and it could potentially slow down a lot if you have very big arrays or arrays that contain very big objects. This means that we can pass an array to a function and just change the elements of that array inside of that function. So here we have an add values function and we're adding numbers to the list and then once it comes back into main, the list items are still there. However, if we're just passing one element of an array into a function, then it is just like any other variable. It will be passed by value. But what if we want to pass an array to a function, and we want to make sure the data in the array doesn't change, such as if we're just outputting the elements of the array? Well, that's when you use a const keyword. Like with other pass by reference parameters, you can use const so that you get the benefit of the speed of passing by reference, with the benefit of not being able to change a value, like with pass by value. 
Also, our rays don't need to be one-dimensional. We can have rays that are 2D, 3D, and more. Though if you find that your arrays are getting really complex, you might want to create a class or a struct instead to hold that data. More on that in another lecture. Arrays are pretty basic, and they don't have any functionality to help you out, so there are some problems you'll need to keep an eye out for when writing programs with arrays. For one, arrays don't keep track of what their size is. You have to manually keep track of this. Because of that, you will need to be careful to make sure that the program does not try to access an index outside of the array, causing an index out of range error. When we have an array as a parameter for a function, we don't need to specify its size. But we do need to specify size when we're declaring an array. So for this example, we have a display function, and it takes in an array of numbers, and it wants the length of that array as well. We can create an array of any size and then pass that in and get the numbers to display. But we need to make sure that we keep track of the length because the array itself doesn't really have a good, easy, simple way to get how many items are in the array. Another problem is that even if you have created an array of some size, that doesn't mean that all of the elements will have been filled. Beyond the maximum array size, you might also need to store how many elements are currently in the array. So for example, you have an array of students, and you know you have a maximum of 30, but you don't know right off the bat how many you'll have, so you add them one at a time. So you'll have to keep the count of how many students are currently in that array, as well as the maximum size of that array. If you access an element that has not been initialized to some value, you'll get garbage, just like if you declare a non-array variable without initializing it. So here's a sample program where we have a list of student names, we have a maximum of 30, and then we're going to create this function to add students to the list. So we have our array of students, we're passing in the name we want to store, and then we're passing in the amount of total students. Every time we add a student, we add one to the total students, and then that way we know how many there are total, and we can iterate appropriately. So we don't go outside of the bounds of the array. Being able to store a list of like data is super useful, but it can also be tricky. Let's work on some programs that will illustrate how we can use arrays. Alright, to get used to working with arrays, let's write another bank application kind of like what we did before. But this time we'll have multiple bank accounts. So, we'll have float balances, and let's say we have 10 different accounts. So for this bank, they're not very secure numbers for the accounts, we have 0 through 9. Uh, if we were actually making a bank, we would probably want more complicated account numbers so nobody could guess it, but this is okay for now. So let's say bool done is false, while, while not done. And then we'll do the menu. How about first, we ask them what account they're using. So we assume that it resets every time. So which, what is your account number? We'll have them input that. We'll hope that it is between 0 and 9, so while account is less than 0, or account is greater than 9, invalid account number, and then we'll ask them again. Okay, so this is the kind of like, the ATM pops up, it wants your card, and every time you do another transaction you have to put your PIN in again. So just kind of think of this as like the first step. Every t once you're done depositing, it's going to close the session and you're going to have to reopen the session again. Just for security reasons. It's a feature. Um, okay. So, then we'll ask what they want to do. If choice is 1, 
else if choice is two, else if, well, let's just say else. If they put three or anything besides one and two, it'll just really not even do anything. It'll just say goodbye, and then they'll be logged out, quote unquote. It, the loop will repeat, and then it'll ask for their account number again. Okay, so float amount, how much to deposit. And we're not going to do the error checking here. We already did that before. So we have the account number. We have the amount they want to deposit. So then we can go say balances. And so if we wanted to access the first account, we would do this. Or we could say the second account, third account. Remember, it starts at zero, so it's kind of offset a little bit. But they already entered their account number. They entered the index that their account is. So we're going to put in ACCT. So if they entered the number zero, this would be balances number zero, and then we'll add the amount to that. And then we will subtract for withdrawal. And since they've already entered their account number, I'm also going to just put their balance here. So balances account. So if we run this, I have an error, let's see. Did I miss something in L here? Now run. What is your account number? So that's invalid. My account number is number zero. Okay. Oh, look, I didn't initialize any of the balances. So I have uh, $2 to the negative 45th power, and that's not much money. So let's go back up here. For int i is zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus. I'm just going to initialize all of these to zero dollars. So account number, it's zero. I have a balance of zero now. I want to with I want to de deposit. I'll put in two hundred bucks, and then it'll log me out. Maybe I should put a message about it. Let's see transaction done, logging out. Just so we know what's going on. Now. I'm going to put in a special command. Let's say if account if account is equal to negative one, let's just output what the value of all of the balances are, just so we can kind of see everything in action. So this is a secret secret command. So we'll say balance for account i is equal to balances i. So this will just put output whatever this is, so it'll go from 0 up to 9, and then it'll tell us the balance that's related to this index number. Okay, so let's run it. Uh, we'll just start with a few different ones and add in different amounts. Deposit negative 50 because we can. Uh, let's see, 5, negative 50. Okay, so the special number is negative one, just to see all of the account information. Okay, so five still has a zero. Didn't I give the negative 50? Five. Withdraw, 5,000. Okay, now let's try that again. There we go. So we can kind of see all the balances for all the accounts. So this is just a simple way you can use an array to store a l the same kind of data, but a list of that kind of data. So, you know, balances, names of students, na ages of students, different things like that. Okay, so let's make some 1D and 2D arrays, and we'll work on a quizzing app. So first, I'm going to create a array of questions. So for now, let's just say we have three questions. Um, and for now, let's create a global variable. Global variables aren't really a good idea, but I'm just going to do this to make this simple. Let's say we have an int for question amount, and we have exactly three. And this is a const int, it's never going to change. There. That way we can kind of just swap this out so we know question amount is always three. We could use our for loops to go from you know zero to three 
and we don't really have to worry about hard coding that number. Now normally I wouldn't declare it up here, I'd declare it somewhere in main and pass it around, but we're just kind of going for something simple right now. Okay, so for every question asked, we're going to have a set of answers, so every question has a set of answers, and there's going to be four answers every question. So this is three sets of answers, but then we have four answers for each question. So I'm going to also say answer amount is four. Now maybe that's a little bit ugly. Um, the, the standard is usually to name your constants in upper cases like this, so they kind of stand out. But you could name them whatever. We could name them just QA and AA to make them a little bit less taking up of so much space. <laughs> but then they're not descriptive. Okay, and then finally, we're going to store the integer of the index of the correct answer. And again, we have that question amount. So we'll have a question, we'll have, you know, answers A, B, C, and D, or whatever, and they'll be the index of the correct answer. So that will be either like 0, 1, 2, or 3. Okay, so I'm going to create a function where I can create some questions. I can get the user to create questions. And we're going to pass in all of our questions. Uh, we don't have to pass in the size of the array when we're making parameters. String answers. I think for 1D arrays you might have to, so I don't know. Let's just keep it all consistent. and correct answer. And now that goes all the way off the side of the screen almost. So I'm putting the declaration up top, I'm putting the definition at the bottom, and then we'll have a function for creating questions. So we know we're going to have three questions that we're going to have them enter, so we'll create a for loop, and we'll make the iterator name Q just because it's for question. Q is less than the question amount, and it increments by one each time. So we know that we want them to enter three questions. It's going to be pretty much the same to get them to answer to enter everything. So we're just going to use a loop. We're not going to manually write down, you know, enter question one, enter question two, enter question three. So first, let's say this is question Q, and I'll say like question zero, and say enter a question, and then we'll use get line, we'll pass in cn, and then we'll say questions at index q. So we're passing in the questions array, this is passed by reference automatically because it's an array. Then we're saying, well, we're going to enter information into questions 0, or 1, or 2, or 3. So each time it'll go through 0 first, then 1, then 2, and so on. Then we'll also do for int a equals zero, a is less than our answer amount, a plus plus, enter, answer, and then we'll give the number, so this answer is number zero or whatever, get line, cn, answers, and then we're going to pass in q, which is what the iterator is currently at, we're at zero or one or two, blah blah blah, and then the current answer index. So again, this will go 0, 1, 2, 3, this will go 0, 1, 2. Okay, so after they enter the answers, then we'll want the answer number, so enter correct answer number, and we'll have them enter the correct answer for Q. And we're going to add cn.ignore here, because since we're changing our cn style from get line to cn, this can cause problems with the buffer where it'll just skip over questions. So cn.ignore flushes the buffer, so by the time we're ready for the next loop around, it'll be, it should be okay. So let me show you this running real quick. Oh, I misspelled this. 
Okay, well, one, we're not calling the function right now, so the program does nothing. So let's call the function. We are going to pass in questions, answers, and correct answer. So these are declared as arrays, but when we're passing them as arguments, we just need to use the variable name. We don't need to use, like, the square brackets, because the parameters already have the square brackets. It already C++ already knows that it's passing arrays over there. So we could say, you know, what is 2 plus 2? 1, 2, 3, 4. Have them say the correct answer is number 3, which here number 3 is this. If we want this to be a little bit easier to read, like for somebody who isn't used to computers starting at the index of 1, we could output plus 1, but still actually use the proper indices. So we'll say, okay, this is question one, but really it's question zero. So they'll enter question. They'll say enter answers, enter answer one, two, three, and four. But then when they go to enter their answer number, they'll enter one, two, three, or four, which is off by one. So we're going to subtract one, or not, not there. We're going to have them enter a value here. And then we have to decrement it by 1, because they've entered, for example, 4 is the correct answer, but really that's 3. So, question 1. What is 2 plus 2? 1, 2, 3, 4. Correct answer is number 4. Okay. So they enter their questions, then we want them to uh, be able to run the question. So, I'm going to create a for loop. This is just to kind of clear out the screen once they're done. I'm just going to output 40 new lines. So that's just so they don't see the questions being created before the quiz is actually run. Alright, so next we'll need a function that will actually run through our quiz questions and have the user answer them. So it's going to be a void quiz, and this time we're going to pass basically all of this stuff, but we're going to do it as const because we are just wanting to get the data from these arrays. We don't want to actually change anything in these arrays. So we'll make these all const, and then I can come down here and put the definition down here. Let me go ahead and also call it from up here. So pretty much the same, even though they're const, they look the same when we're calling the function. And then down here, let's work on quiz. So. Let's give the user a score. They'll start out with zero. And just like up here, they're going to get all three questions. Now, if I weren't using these constants to store a question amount, if I wanted to actually make this a dynamically sized array, I would store that and I would pass that in. We haven't gone over dynamically sized arrays, we haven't gone over dynamic memory management yet, so that's why this is just kind of hard-coded at 3. But later on, we can give this a different size. Like, if the user enters, you know, I want 5 questions or 10 questions, we can make the array that size, and then pass the size around. Okay, so, first, let's have them... Let's see, we'll say your score is... and show them the score. We'll say question number and we'll output q plus 1, so they get, you know, 1, 2, 3, instead of 0, 1, 2. And then we'll output the first question. After that, we need to output our answers, so for a is 0, a is less than 4, a plus plus, we'll output, I'm going to put a plus 1, so it shows, you know, answer number 1, and then answers Q and A. So this is actually very similar to when we're creating our quiz, except that instead of getting an, getting information from the user and in putting it into the answers at, you know, Q A, we're actually just outputting the data here. Okay, so after they see the answers, then we'll want them to input one. So your answer, we'll make an integer, They'll input an answer, and we'll have to subtract it by 1, because, again, this will show 1, 2, 3, 4, instead of 0, 1, 2, 3. 
So we have to decrement it just to make sure we have the right thing. We can say if answer is equal to correct answer for this question. Otherwise, okay, so we can say correct. L and we'll add one to the score or we'll say wrong. Okay, and then once the for loop is done, that means they've gone through all three questions, we'll end up telling them the results. So you got score out of, and then we can even output our question amount down here, and then end it with a, an exclamation point. So, and if we wanted to, we could return an integer, so return the score, but that's not really needed. This is just kind of running one and then running the other. So, oh, question, this is questions. So, we'll just do something simple. What is 5 plus 5? And we'll, you know, give them some random stuff. Answer is number 2. What, what is 2 plus 2? Four, three, two, one. Okay. The answer is one, even though you might want to enter like four as the answer to the math problem. And what is five plus three? This is one, five, eight, seven. And then we'll do three. Okay, so then remember that I output 40 lines of white space. That's what this is right here. Uh, if you knew that you had a certain amount of lines in your program, like if the console always opened at the same size, you could, you know, specify, oh, only draw 10 lines of white space or something, but mine can resize, so I don't know for sure, so I just did 40. Okay, so question number one, score zero, what is five plus five? Number two. Okay, so what is two plus two? Now I can... I haven't put any error checking, so I could like enter some random number as the answer and it'll tell me I'm wrong, but so that would be something you'd want to check for to make sure they're entering a valid number. So three. It got two out of three and then the program ends.